Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that the Yoruba, an African ethnic group, have an oddly high birth rate of twins, which make them the prime study group for research in the field of heritability. Anytime someone tells you something is or isn't possible, genetically or biologically, all you have to do is say, what about the Yoruba? And until we can explain exactly why they have an unusual high birth rate of twins, it's safe to say there's a lot we still don't know about the inner workings of our own biology. We're learning how to hack it on a daily basis, but there are lots of things that were once considered impossible that are absolutely routine and normal, including things like neuroplasticity. So never fall uh, prey to the idea that something can or can't work because the assumptions you're making are assuming that everything that we think we know is accurate and that we know everything. And those are both false assumptions. They're provably false. So we don't know everything. In fact, I don't think we'll ever know everything, but we'll always know more. And that's why this is so much fun. Today is one of those podcasts where we get to learn more because it's an opportunity for Dr. Mark Atkinson, uh, the lead bulletproof or the leader of bulletproof coaching training and me to answer questions from you. So over the past few months, the Bulletproof team has been collecting questions sent in via the blog, social media, and even a few of them recorded live at the last Bulletproof biohacking conference. And we are going to answer those questions for you today. And speaking of the Bulletproof biohacking conference, if you haven't seen the website for bulletproofconference.com or you haven't thought about it, from September 23rd through 25th of this year, we're expecting several thousand people in Pasadena, California at the Bulletproof Conference. This is our fourth annual conference. The first conference was in San Francisco. It was only 100 people. That was three and a half short years ago. Now we're looking at several thousand people because biohacking has taken off. So if you're interested in seeing and feeling and experiencing and, and touching and playing with the things that give you control of your own biology, this is a place for you. World-class speakers, an amazing group of people where you can become friends with luminaries in the field and just other people who care about their own biology, their own performance as much as you do, this is the place to go. And there's basically an adult playground there with all of the toys. You ever want to try neurofeedback? Did you want to try hyperbaric oxygen? Did you want to see those two giant new Bulletproof products that we have to bring there in trucks that change the way your mitochondrial function? Hmm you should come to the Bulletproof Conference. So go to bulletproofconference.com and check it out. You can still get early bird pricing, and this is one of my favorite things to do every single year. I get to spend several days with a few thousand people who care about all this stuff as much as I do, and it's just fantastic amounts of fun, and we get to play. Mm-hmm. See you there. All right, Mark, you're going to be there because we're doing Bulletproof Coach training right before the conference. So um, people who come in for the training get to also go to the conference, right? Yeah, they do. And, you know, um, I went for the first time last year, and... It was incredible. You know, <laughs> when you're so, when, when people are so passionate about improving themselves, discovering more and more things about themselves, to be surrounded by hundreds and thousands of other people doing exactly the same thing, you find something that some people struggle to find, which is community. Yeah. Sometimes the whole um, biohacking movement <laughs> can feel like, you know, people around just think you're crazy. They don't understand it. But get together with other biohackers and it's like game on. It just brings out the best in you. That's actually why I started the first conference in San Francisco. Like I, I lost money on it. Like This still isn't a money-making thing for Bulletproof. This is like, uh, I'm hoping we break even because we throw an epic conference and we bring we bring everything. We bring so many Bulletproof employees, but it, it's it's there because I want to hang out with cool people. Yeah, <laughs> it, and it, you know, it's just fun and, you know, the standard of the the presentations yeah, and the teaching good. is incredible. So um, I'm just looking forward to, to that as well. All right, so now we just plugged the living crap out of the Bulletproof <laughs> Conference. Did you guys catch that? Were we sneaky on you? But seriously, <laughs> it's that good. It is so great. I, I'm willing to share the stuff I care about. And let me tell you, the amount of my personal effort as well as the entire Bulletproof team for this conference, like it is the single biggest event like this in the entire year. And it's kind of all hands on deck. So it's a big production, but it's Done out of love. Yeah. All right. Let's answer some questions for people because that's why they're here. Let's do it. Okay. So first question is from Sharon, age 56. So I love the biohacking conference last year. However, I came away feeling like I'm going to be the last person with any signs of aging. What do you think of all the interventions younger women seem to be doing these days, including Retin-A, Botox, skin whitening formulas, etc.? 
anything to prevent signs of aging from showing? That's a very interesting question. Yeah. I'm of two minds about that. And one of them is absolutely amazing. You should do this. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of the stuff, especially the, the preparations, have toxins and things that cause harm to the body. So to the extent that you're doing anti-aging treatments that actually support your biology, you're crazy not to do that. You'll live longer if you do those things. Mm -hmm. Like you'll look better, it's good. But if you're doing the things that take away from your biology to make you look better, you're not gonna do it. So you, I don't think you can say that they're good or bad. Mm -hmm. I can tell you Botox, probably not great for you, but probably not that harmful. There's evidence mm -hmm. that it accumulates somewhere in a basal ganglia. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the overall scheme of things, it does have a pretty large impact. If you don't do too much of it, if you do too much of it, you're gonna look like sort of a robot face. Mm -hmm. um, but it's probably not that harmful. Uh, but you might be able to do better, and I'm not really planning to do it. Uh, skin whitening formulas, depends what's in them, right? That's it. Uh, and then what else? We have uh, Retin-A. I think Retin-A is probably not a bad thing. Do you have mm. any good evidence about Retin-A? I, I don't know that much, and, and the way I feel about the whole anti-aging movement is, is like it is so important to feel good about yourself. You know, we all have a fundamental right to feel good about ourselves, mm -hmm. and that means a whole bunch of things. And But if it's just cosmetic, without changing the inner biology, then that's an issue. Because when you take control of your biology, you naturally will become much more youthful. And also, you just gotta check in with the intentionality behind it. Is it coming from some obsession, or from um, self-rejection, or self-criticism? Yeah. What is the driver? So before we engage in any anti-aging approach, What's the intention behind here? Is this coming from a place of self-acceptance? And let's never, never lose sight of that the thing that really creates the most beauty, this is my personal perspective, is someone who is happy and joyous and living a fulfilling and engaging life because that just radiates through. I, I thought you were gonna say a heart-shaped butt. I, I, I mean, jeez, <laughs> Mark. I was, I was building up to that. <laughs> <laughs> what he said. Now, all right, let, let's talk about this. I, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. going I'm, yeah, I'm to I'm gonna show off my abs. You guys ready? All right, so, so check this out. I'm not really going to show off my abs. But it, you should watch this on YouTube video. But do you see all these bandages right here? Right? That's because I just had a relatively deep laser treatment because I have massive stretch marks. You probably can't see them on camera, but like over here, like it looks like I have surgical scars. Right, that sucks, mm. and that's because I was covered in stretch marks. Well, I still am covered in stretch marks, but I was obese, so I just had this laser thing done because stretch marks suck, yeah, they do. and I have like hundreds of them, so I'm not going to get rid of all of them because I'd have to replace half my skin. But I'm writing a book about stretch mm. marks because mm. all of these were preventable, and prevention is much better than reversing. So I'm going through the work of reversing these, but we have you know 80 pages of research about how and why they form, so that if I could go back in time and tell myself when I started getting these when I was 16, here's why it's happening, here's what to do about it, I would have two stretch marks instead of like 200. Mm -hmm. So now I'm gonna go through, I'm reversing on this side. It doesn't hurt at all, but it's annoying to cover them in Vaseline for five days and keep them in bandages, which is what I'm doing. So I'll mm -hmm. talk about this at the conference uh, as well. But that's a cosmetic treatment. I will not die. I already have kids. I'm already married. Like, like I don't need to have no stretch marks. But mm. hey, I like to control my own biology. It's my hobby. So mm. I did that. This is an example of a cosmetic thing. It, it is. And, and that stuff does matter. You know, I've, I've worked with patients who have scars that you know, people can see. And there's always a part of them that's aware of that. And it does just undermine ever society sometimes their self-esteem. And that's just good self-care. It's like you want to feel good about yourself but just make sure the foundations are in place. So make sure you're nailing your nutrition, your lifestyle, your sleep, you're on the right supplements, you know, you're, you're living an engaged and fulfilling life, you're attending to your relationships, that's the foundation, and then, then consciously choose what you wanna build into that in terms of the cosmetics. Yeah. But just watch the obsessive side of it because I see a lot of that as well, which yeah. is that people start tweaking with the way they appear, then it's not quite enough, and they go down that kind of slippery slope. And if you see that in yourself, and you're listening to this and think, yeah, that is me, then you, know, you may want to share that with someone, find you know, a therapist to talk about that, because that can be soul destroying yeah. when you start to obsess about your appearance. It, you'll also end up with a uh, frozen face, giant lips, and you'll look kind of like Michael Jackson did towards the end of his life, yeah. uh, where it doesn't lead to a good place. So you can have control of your biology, mm -hmm. and that's you know the art and science of biohacking there. 
And what you do with it is up to you. I, mm. I fully expect in 100 years, there'll be people who are like, you know, I, I decided I wanted to grow an extra <laughs> whatever <laughs> somewhere. And we'll have pretty radical control of our bodies because we'll mm. understand cell differentiation and mm. de-differentiation. So I, I'm all over you having the, the freedom to do whatever you want with your body. Mm. Uh, but if what you decide to do is actually lowering your performance and it, it, it's done out of a, a sense of fear and loss, we have problems. Um, that mm. said, look, I'll be really blunt. Whether you're a man or a woman, if you look healthy, you get paid more and people treat you differently. Mm. So there is a, a financial incentive, especially if you work in Los Angeles <laughs> mm. or you work in entertainment. And there are major uh, uh, A-list celebrities who use bulletproof techniques to look good from the inside out. Mm. I th I'm pretty sure that most of them are also doing retin-A and Botox, uh, hydrofacials and all that kind of stuff. It, it actually takes a lot of money and time to do those things. Uh, I also, at the Bulletproof Conference, I have three experts on stem cells this year because I'm a biohacker and because I like to get started early. I had stem cells injected all over my face. I also had them injected intravenously and in every injury site. So I, I went in for injuries, but I'm like, hey, if I'm going to have stem cells, they're going to be nailing things into my bone marrow. I'll be damned if I'm not getting those on my face. And I have to say, I'm looking very youthful, am I not? Let's go with that. <laughs> you are. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, so uh, next question from Marcus, age 28. I've been suffering from irritable bowel syndrome for more than 10 years and I am fed up with it. I've tried probiotics, exclusion diets, but nothing seems to help. Would appreciate any suggestions that you might have. Well, I have a lot to say on this. Why don't you um, start and then um, I'll, I'll yeah, follow up with some interesting yeah, ideas. <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> Okay, so um, first up, just really sharing from personal experience, I had IBS for about 20 years of my life. And I know that misery that can come with it. When, you know, you suddenly struck with abdominal pains. In fact, I, I still have it. <laughs> you still got it. That's why you're fidgeting the chair all the time. <laughs> I don't still have it, but and, yeah, um, it's, so it's uncomfortable. It's, I've it's, had it. Yeah. It's really, it can be really bad and just really undermine your confidence yeah. and, and deplete your energy. Um, but what, there's a couple of things I just want to share. One is that um, there's always a cause for the IBS. IBS isn't a helpful term at all. It's like we should just scrap the term IBS because really what we want to do is we want to assume the role of a detective and the role of a detective is to systematically go through the possible causes and contributors and if you don't possess that knowledge, you find someone who does. So this is really <laughs> where a functional medicine practitioner yeah. would be really great. But there's some basic things we want to start with. First of all, you know, really make sure you exclude celiac disease. That's one not to miss. So mm -hmm. celiac disease, it's an autoimmune disease triggered by gluten, affects the small intestine, affects absorption of nutrients, and that can cause bowel disturbance. You can do a home test for that pretty straight up. So just make sure that's not there. Then the next big thing, of course, is food sensitivities. Yes. And then you've got your top food sensitivities of dairy. So it turned out I was... Uh, intolerant to dairy, you've got wheat, eggs, soy, could be pretty much anything. So you've got to systematically go through those. How do you do that? Well, you've got a couple of options. You can do your IgG um, food intolerance testing. Some controversy around that, but in clinical reality, it's actually really helpful to do that. There's only controversy from people who don't have food sensitivities. And have never done it themselves yeah. and never experienced the benefit <laughs> it, of doing it. Works. It works. <laughs> right. it, it really works. You can do the elimination diet, but unless you're my experience is unless you're really good at being organized and planning and, and on the controlling side of things, that's pretty tricky it, to do. It took me almost two years to do the elimination diet when I yeah, first started this in, in the late 90s. Yeah. And I mean, it is the classical stuff is really hard to do. Really so hard. Uh, yeah. that's one of the reasons on the Bulletproof diet, I'm like, just exclude all of these things. And if you have IBS, yes. take out eggs as well, which are in the Bulletproof foods because they're so good for you, but they tend to be an immune trigger for a lot of people. Yeah. It, so if you only eat Green Zone for a week or two, uh, there's a two-week plan in the book. Mm. What happens after that? I imagine your symptoms might be different. And if they're not, that's also a really good data point. But that's kind of like a whole two years of elimination diets all in one. Just pull out all the stuff that's bad, and what's left is just a few things. And that's generally how I start with patients. You just pull out mm -hmm. all the kind of classic yeah. kind of irritants. Uh, lactose malabsorption is really important. So um, lactose is a sugar inside milk and dairy products. Um, as people age, particularly if they're of African, Hispanic, Asian origin or Mediterranean, mm -hmm. Uh, the amount of lactase, the enzyme in small intestine that breaks down that sugar diminishes. So what happens is you get 
you eat dairy, then about half an hour, an hour later, you get this bloating, you get gas mm -hmm. production. Fructose malabsorption as Huge well. Huge one. Yeah. That's really big. If you have lactose malabsorption, you've got a higher chance of having fructose malabsorption. Mm -hmm. So we have specialist transporters in the small intestine that take the fructose from normal kind of fruit and they transport it across the, um, the cell wall of the small intestine into the body. If that's not working properly, we don't have enough of them, all of that fructose moves on down to the large intestine and gets fermented, creates a lot of gas. Now, if you have things like apples, pears, peaches, mangoes, watermelon, and after a half an hour you start getting a lot of gas, a lot of bloating, then that could be a contributing factor to it. And wrapped up in that is what we call FODMAPS. So ah, FODMAPS good, yeah. is this really cool kind of acronym, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And basically, these are short-chain fermentable carbohydrates that if you eat, um, can create a lot of gas. And so these are things like dairy products, uh, chickpeas, lentils, beans, the fruit I just mentioned before, mm -hmm. um, high and, fructose and, corn syrup. Importantly, xylitol and erythritol uh, are also on this, and sorbitol. Are on and the sorbitol, list. mannitol. I like xylitol and erythritol. For most people, they're actually amazing sweeteners because they taste like sugar and they actually have health benefits. Mm -hmm. But if you have IBS, you might need to be off of all fermentable things at least for a yeah, while. Exactly, and just do that as a two-week trial. Yeah. And you can go on the internet, just Google low FODMAP diet, loads of stuff out there. Yeah. But the big thing not to miss is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yep. Okay, so the research shows maybe 50% of people with IBS actually have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I, I used to have that for sure. Okay. Yeah. So, and I was diagnosed with it about six months ago as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. I was. And you know what? It's amazing to me. I've known about it for a while, but sometimes self-diagnosis, tricky thing, right? Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Did you always have this? Because I, here's what I think is going on. Yeah. And, and this is really cool biohacking stuff. We know that if you live in a house with toxic mold, mm. um, or you're just exposed to it in the environment around mm. you, uh, that it can cause the formation of biofilms, mm. especially inside the sinuses. Mm. So the biofilms are when bacteria stack themselves up, they form little circulatory systems, and they protect themselves from toxins in the environment around them. This is why surgical implants and hospital infections are so bad. Uh, biofilms are like very destructive industrially too. It's like mm. these slimy mm. layers that form on things. Well, a SIBO is essentially a biofilm in the gut, mm. right? So I believe that when we are exposed to environmental, not necessarily nutritional, uh, mycotoxins or mold toxins, I did a whole documentary about this, moldymovie.com. It, it's one of the biggest sources of, of kryptonite in the modern it environment. Like yeah. it, it's affecting hundreds of millions of people's mental health and well being on a regular basis. Like that's why it, there's a documentary. But I think what's going on here is that people tend to get SIBO when they live in moldy environments because the mold sends a signal to the bacteria to form a biofilm. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you always had SIBO or if mm. your SIBO changed mm. in relation to your exposure to the environment around you. My, my take on that is that um, when I was exposed to mold, a couple of things happened. One is my digestive symptoms got worse and I had yeah. a whole bunch of allergies and hay fever. It just kicked it off. Yeah. And so the amount of stress that was downloaded into my biology triggered and exacerbated all of this. And so with SIBU, what you get is this kind of bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine. And that means that when you consume carbohydrates, they ferment and they create kind of a lot of gas, and a lot of abdominal discomfort. And so you can actually test for this. So you can get what's called a lactulose breath test. Basically, you take um, lactulose and you measure the amount of hydrogen and methane in your breath over a period of a couple of hours. I did the test. And what it showed was there's this early spike of hydrogen, which is coming from the bacteria in the small intestine. Now, the good news is it can be treated. And so you treat it with this antibiotic called rifaximin, and then that followed by berberine and oregano and garlic. And, you know, you, you know I was on a low carb diet anyway, but that's an essential part of it. But hey, it's like once you start treating that, your energy levels shoot up, you come more alive. But here's the key. If the initial trigger for it is the mold, that's what you have to deal with. You gotta reverse the environmental inputs you, that cause the system to fail. Yeah, so it's yeah. like sometimes we think too narrowly. It's like, okay, so I've got a gut problem, so all my figs are good. No, as a general rule of thumb, look around your environment first. Mm -hmm. What in my environment is compromising my energy and my vitality and my performance? And you've got to think, it's like, dust my allergies. Is it environmental allergens? 
Is it mold? It's just a systematic approach. Then, okay, what about the food that I'm ingesting? And you know, so you realize, wow, it's like when I have apples, I get kind of like this kind of bloating, or if I have xylitol, or whatever it may be. So you start like mm -hmm. adopting the position of a, of a detective. And so with when I took this and treated it, it's like wow, it's just like my energy goes up. You know, it went back to normal again. So basically, I share this because those are the kind of things that you want to. Um, consider. And just for someone who's listening to this, if you don't know much about irritable bowel syndrome, I just want to explain a little bit about what the symptoms are, just so you can recognize yeah, it yourself. Yeah. Um, so there's an organization called the Rome Foundation, not-for-profit, who brought together the world's leading Rome, R-O-M-E. Okay. Um, that's the English accent. And, um, <laughs> and they've brought together all of the world's leading experts, and they have created some diagnostic criteria. And so if you're listening to this and you get recurrent abdominal pain, just listen into this because this, this may be helpful to you. So basically, if you get recurrent abdominal pain occurring a minimum of once a week, you've had it for three months at least, and that's associated with pain that is relieved by going to the toilet, defecation, and or with constipation or diarrhea, and it's been going on for a total of six months, that is the diagnostic criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. However, if you're listening to this, and this pain starts um, after the age of 50, you have a fever, um, the pain keeps you up awake at night time, you get night sweats, unintentional weight loss, those are what in medicine we call red flag signs. So if you have any of those red flag signs, you've got to go and see a doctor and have more serious things excluded. Like cancer and things like that? You got it. And infl inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, got it. it it's, uh, it's interesting because when you look at, say, a study of how often you should fart. <laughs> yes, I said fart. I love it in medical terms, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're based on people eating whole grain, bizarre diets yeah, that probably right. aren't that natural. Here's what I learned having been obese and having room clearing gas as a regular part of my mm. life for a large portion of my mm. life. Um, when you eat what you're supposed to eat, including a plate full of vegetables at most meals with a moderate amount of high quality protein and masses of fat, you actually don't have lots of gas. And if you do, it, it, it doesn't really smell bad. Mm. <laughs> and it's not that you think it doesn't smell bad, it's that the people around you think it doesn't smell <laughs> bad. <laughs> uh, so I've seen huge changes there from adopting the Bulletproof Diet. Uh, to the point that it, it was actually kind of liberating uh, to just have that have that effect. The same thing goes for, well, we'll just get kind of gross here, like stools. Even if you don't have IBS, you're just sitting here like, okay, like if, if you have extremely foul-smelling stools, there's something not happy going on yeah. in there if it happens all the time. If it happens every now and then, dude, what did you eat? Like you mm -hmm. did something to cause that, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of knowledge where like, oh, wow, I actually, I, I, I don't know how to put it, you know, but like, uh, I, I'm not one of people goes around saying, you know, my, my shit doesn't stink. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the deal. It does, but not nearly as much as it used to. So this yeah. is a sign, an yeah. early sign, that if things aren't coming out the way they should, your performance will be hindered on that day. Like, Absolutely. Literally that day. You'll get brain fog and like you just won't be able to think. Yeah. So basically, do not ignore it. If, if, you, if you have farts that stink or your stool stinks, that is not normal. That yeah. is not healthy. And if that's consistent, then that normally shows there's dysbiosis, gut flora imbalance, mm -hmm. could be small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Here's a couple of things most people don't know. If you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it'll often get worse if you add fiber and probiotics. Absolutely, you'll feel like crap. You'll just feel, it's like, you're thinking, well, okay, I know probiotics are good for me, so I'm taking the probiotics, and yet you're gonna feel terrible. Mm -hmm. And that's because there's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth there. And there's something called LPS, lipopolysaccharides. And these are toxins made by bacteria in your gut. And on those days when you have foul smelling stools, your production of lipopolysaccharides will be higher. These things cross the gut barrier to some degree or another, depending on how healthy your gut barrier is. But when you have lots of them, they can cross it. They impact liver function and they cross the blood brain barrier and they give you brain fog. So there's a direct correlation between having foul smelling stools and having slightly less cognitive performance. That's just how it is. Like we understand the pathways, mm. at least some mm. of the pathways for this. So yeah. like acknowledge that. And that's one of the things that you should be tracking and hacking. You don't have to journal how you smell, but just take note of it. Like it, it's, yeah. it's an, uh, not a pretty conversation here, yeah. but 
this actually it, matters. It's really important and yeah. it affects a lot of people. So I think also this would be a good time to just talk about the five R's just very briefly. So in functional medicine, we talk about the five R's of, right. of gut health. And this is just a simple, systematic way to approach any gut health related kind of issue. Mm -hmm. And the first R is for remove. And remove is basically removing what, like, what we call kryptonite. So yeah. foods and th anything that undermines your performance and your energy like, like and your, your function. Like your mother-in-law? <laughs> mother-in-law, top of the list. <laughs> followed, by, <laughs> followed by foods. And, and yeah. so that would be the gluten, the dairy, mm -hmm. and whatever else might be. Then you've got to also remove pathogenic organisms as well. So you can do the breath test, but if you work with a functional medicine practitioner, they'll probably do a stool yeah. analysis, and so mm -hmm. they can look for bacteria, they can look for parasites, that kind of thing. So you want to remove the bad stuff. Then you want to replace. So a significant number of people don't produce enough stomach acid, or they don't have yeah. enough pancreatic enzymes. Huge. It's huge. It really is, and you know. I'm conventionally medically trained, and of course, we were hardwired to think, well, people produce too much stomach acid. Yeah. And actually, you know, very early on, when doctors start learning about functional medicine, about real people, and, and how to help them, you realize, wow, that's topsy turvy. Mm -hmm. It's the wrong way around. Actually, a lot of people need extra betaine hydrochloride, which I, you can get as a supplement. I did for almost almost 10 years. I, I was taking six grams with each meal, which that's, is six a, big capsules yeah, to get enough yeah. stomach acid to digest my food. And when I did that, I was like, wow, I feel better. Feel my digestion's sad. better. I don't need it anymore. I restored my yeah, natural production. I, yeah. I digest everything just fine now, which is cool. Yeah, and if you eat a meal and you feel heavy afterwards, then that may indicate, as long as you haven't got gastritis or ulcer, that you would benefit from a trial of betaine hydrochloride, and you just gradually increase the dose. And you know, that kind of stuff's online, you can read yeah. about it. So we got, um, we got remove, um, we got um, replace, and then we got re-inoculate, and that's putting in the good bacteria, the probiotics, the prebiotics. Um, and then we've got, um, what's the next one? Um, repair, really important. So you've removed the bad stuff, you put in the probiotics, and then you want to take things like L-glutamine, zinc, um, vitamin D, uh, vitamin A, all those kind of things that help the gut to repair. And okay. then you want to rebalance, and rebalance is just about just living a healthy lifestyle. So those are the five R's, look them up online, and it's just a really kind of, really simple framework for dealing with gut health. But if you do all of that, and it doesn't help, or you're getting overwhelmed, seek the help of a functional medicine practitioner. Yeah, functional medicine rocks. Yeah. Now, L-glutamine is a very interesting amino acid, which is worth talking about. L-glutamine is something I used to rely on when I was going to Wharton. I was getting my MBA. I was working at a startup full time, and my brain was failing. Like I, I was mm. just about failing out of classes. I just couldn't pay attention. Um, I had stress. I had all, all kinds of bad stuff going on. In fact, this is when I discovered modafinil, the, the smart drug. Mm. I was like, wow, this this really helped me. But one thing I noticed, and I'd already known for several years, was that L-glutamine would totally fix my performance some of the time. So mm -hmm. I would take about 10 grams, which is mm -hmm. a, a big scoop of this kind of neutral tasting powder. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, this is great. And I was giving it to my classmates. And the ones who were like, oh, I'm tired. And you give them L-glutamine, like, woohoo, I feel great. So this is a, a neat hack, but there's a downside to glutamine that isn't well known. Glutamine will almost instantly take you out of ketosis. So ketosis provides additional mitochondrial energy, yes. like burning fat instead of burning sugar, and it's anti-inflammatory, and it's antioxidant, and literally, it, it is like the superpower. That's why I put brain octane in every meal every day, because brain octane is a source of exogenous ketones. It actually converts to ketones. It's the number one source of external driven ketones that anyone can get today. Like, like it, it's the most mm. common one out there. Mm. And it's different than MCT oil, which doesn't raise ketones the same amount, and profoundly different than coconut oil, which doesn't raise ketones more than just fasting, for instance. So coconut oil just isn't a good source of MCTs if you're looking at ketone production. Yeah. This isn't well known, but we've mm -hmm. got the science, mm -hmm. right? So when I, I look at that, I'm like, okay, I have brain octane, I have ketosis, and then I take glutamine, it pulls me out of that. So there's still gonna be some ketones present, but you're not gonna get exactly the same thing that you would get from nutritional ketosis. Yeah. So I'm happy to do brain octane plus glutamine, but if you're gonna do carb restriction in glutamine, it will not work. So if you're on the Bulletproof diet and you're on a day when you wanna be in nutritional ketosis, don't take glutamine that day. Or say, you know what, I've got gut issues. L-glutamine in high doses can heal my gut, 
screw ketosis for today. Exactly. I'm going to get exogenous ketones yeah. a little bit from brain octane, and I, I just don't need to be on carb restricted. I need my gut to work today, and, yeah. and that's fine. Yeah, it's kind of what's most important. And just one final thing with l glutamine. So I work with a lot of people with cancer, and l glutamine is also a source of fuel for cancer cells mm -hmm. as well. So we don't want to be doing that if you have cancer. But if you're going through radiotherapy, then actually, you know, it's actually a relatively good thing they have because it actually protects the health of your uh, gut mucosa. So it's a really important subject, but we could yeah. talk about that for, uh, for a long time, for a whole episode. <laughs> All right, let's go with Michelle. Uh, okay, Michelle, uh, age 43. Hi, Dave. I'm in love with my morning cup of bulletproof coffee. Um, it is so yummy and creamy. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Michelle. <laughs> I started following the diet recently and couldn't believe how quickly I was losing weight and it didn't even seem like I was trying. All right. uh, one question though, I'm not a big fan of red meat. Is there a substitution that I can have instead and still get the same results from? Thank you and please hurry and bring your shops to the San Francisco Bay Area. All right, I'm working on it for you in the San Francisco <laughs> Bay Area. Um, definitely looking for the right partners to make that happen. Uh, so just to get that one out of the way, yeah, I mean, I. I love the Bay Area. I have tons of friends there, and I lived there for quite a while. And Silicon Valley is there, so uh, you can count on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's big demand. But if you don't like red meat, what do you do? I would say look at the Bulletproof Diet Roadmap, and if you're listening to this and you don't have it printed out on your fridge, it's free. Go to the Bulletproof website, search for Roadmap, and it's a one-page infographic that tells you what to eat. And you'll find wild-caught fish is, is high on the list. So you can do this mostly with wild-caught fish, the, the thing is though, even if a couple times a week you can do some grass-fed meat, even if it's not your favorite, uh, that's gonna make a difference. And the reason is that there are some things like CLA that you can get in that meat and some other fat-soluble vitamins that just aren't available in fish. I recommend everyone eat fish. Uh, you wanna get the DHA and the EPA from fish, and fish is a good source of protein, uh, but it's generally not fatty enough. Mm. And just, just once a week, have a little bit of red meat, and you'll like how you feel, even if it's not your favorite meal, would be my recommendation. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say as okay. well, so I think we're gonna... <laughs> There's something around yeah. arachidonic acid too, which is mm. a little bit controversial. We talk about eating omega-6 oils, uh, the relatively damaged ones, like mm. corn oil and soybean mm. oil and things like that. And one of the reasons that we don't eat a lot of those is because they raise arachidonic acid too much. Mm. But if you're getting lightly cooked grass-fed meat, you're getting some undamaged, straight-up arachidonic acid versus precursors to Which it. Which you do need. There you go. You need it for your brain, and you need yes. it for your cell membranes. Yeah. And this is one of the things, if, you're, yeah. if you go bulletproof, it takes about two years, well, 700 days, to replace half the fat in your cell membranes. Mm. If you're getting these egg yolks, which is another good source of arachidonic acid, mm. and grass-fed beef or lamb, that isn't burned to a crisp, that's important mm. you don't damage all the fat, you're actually gonna get better cell membranes over the course of years, and that's mm. kind of a neat hack there. Just eating fish all the time can actually, it can actually harm your mm. cell membranes. You can get yeah. too much DHA and too much EPA in the cell membrane, and when that happens, you get excess fluidity, and it's not mm. normal, and it contributes to biotoxin illness. Like, who would have thought an overdose mm. of fish oil could do that, but it can. Yeah. And that is a concern with fish, right? I mean, it, it is heartbreaking one level that so many fish, you know, have such high levels of, of toxins. And of course, most people listening to this will know about uh, tuna, um, mercury. but, and mercury. And, and that, that's so, so unfortunate. And, you know, our seas are contaminated. That's affecting the fish. And, and so really that's why grass-fed meat is, is really ideally um, an important staple. I understand it can be expensive but it's about quality um, and really when you, um, I often find this as well that you know, when people eat a lot of meat, most people eat meat unconsciously and they're just so used to kind of eating it vast quantities without yeah. ever really tasting it. The great thing with kind of grass-fed meat is you slow right down and you really enjoy it and then you delight in your body's response to it. Most yeah. people will find they just this the kind of the wave of well-being. It's just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. And so just putting it out there, just reminding how important it is to slow down and really pay attention to quality. And, and then you can eat smaller portion yeah. size. You don't need much. That, that's the trick. And, and people say, oh, it's really expensive. It's expensive if you eat a one pound steak. Yeah. But the whole point is a moderate amount of high quality protein. A high protein diet is bad for you. It gives you cancer over time. It causes yeah, inflammation. It gives yeah. you ammonia. Yeah. So using protein as fuel is, is really a bad idea. It, it's probably better than using sugar for fuel. 
Yeah, um, but it's not a good way to live. Uh, yeah, using yeah, yeah. vegetables as mass and using fat as fuel and protein mm-hmm. as building blocks is what you want to do to live a long time. In fact, that's the yeah. bulletproof diet. Yeah. So if the meat's twice as expensive and you eat half as much, you actually did the same thing. And all you need to do is, is get a, a freezer. Costco will sell your freezer for about 150 bucks, a little miniature chest freezer. And then you go online, and I have several blog posts about my favorite grass-fed, uh, grass-fed sources, and you buy... 40 or 50 pounds of grass-fed hamburger, it'll cost mm. you around five bucks a pound. Mm. Like, yeah, it's not expensive. Really yeah. It's expensive if you go to the grass-fed gourmet restaurant mm. and order the $40 grass-fed steak. That's cheap, mm. by the way. Mm. Uh, okay, you don't have to do that. Like, like yeah. that's a mental model that's broken. Literally, yeah. a pound of meat for five or six bucks, throw it in a pan with some butter and some salt. There mm. you go, oregano if you want to be fancy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't need a pound of that, so you're talking 250. Two dollars and fifty cents. Like that's a happy meal, all right. <laughs> like just don't talk to me about expensive. And and also, um, a lot of people use meat to fill themselves up. On no, use green vegetables yeah. to give yourself the yeah, volume. Those, those are expensive. Yeah, that's where the yeah, that's where the <laughs> expense is. But you know, remember the bulletproof diet is actually high in vegetables, and yeah. you, know, you want to be make sure the vegetables there they give the bulk, and then that's complemented with with the kind of meat. Yeah. Okay, that's a good question though. Okay, so next question is from Jim, age 26. He is at medical school, uh, pretty stressed out with all of the work I have to do. Let's bring back memories. Um, <laughs> plus, my diet's not great, of course. Any tips for helping me manage the stress and kick ass at the exams? Well, I can think of two things right <laughs> off the top of my head. Number one, heart rate variability training. Mm. If you're not doing your uh, 10 minutes a day with a heart rate monitor, you are going to have lots of stress before the exam. I would recommend doing it before you, you go to take the exam. You'll take yourself out of the fight or flight mode, which you know, there's always fear of failure and, you know, I want to pass the exam. So you get all that stress. You can just turn off all those voices in your head and you do it by changing the spacing between your heartbeats. There's plenty written on the Bulletproof blog about heart rate variability training. That's one side of things. The other thing, I'm just going to throw it out there. How did I get through Wharton? I actually, for some of the first exams, I'm like, I'm sort of cheating here. So I, I took smart drugs, like flat up pharmaceutical smart drugs and natural supplements. Now there's so many more things. You get glutathione, mm-hmm. you get unfair advantage, uh, you can get uh, the upgraded aging formula we make. Those are all cognitive boosting formulas. And choline force is another one. But if you want to get modafinil, if I was in med school, I would absolutely be taking modafinil if it worked for me and it works for most people. I would probably steer clear of Adderall and things like that. If you're not taking aniracetam, one of my very favorite uh, quasi-legal smart drugs, that stuff increases memory I.O., the ability to get stuff in and out of your memory. You want to lower your stress? <laughs> be able to pull things out of your memory more easily on a test. Yeah. You'll be less stressed. So I literally lined up my smart drugs on the, at the desk in front of me when I was getting my Ivy League MBA. And I'm like, hey, guys, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doping, but it's not illegal. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not breaking the rules, but I'm disclosing because I don't want you know, an appearance of impropriety. And by the way, if anyone wants some of my non, non-prescription smart drugs, I'll share them because I think this is part of being human. Yeah, this is really important. And OK, so you know, obviously, I've been through medical school myself. I remember it well. If you're drinking loads of alcohol, <laughs> Stop. Stop. <laughs> you know, I have to say that because <laughs> medical you. students drink. <laughs> you have to be insane to be in a high stress yeah, academic environment I mean, and get drunk all the time. It is incompatible <laughs> with good memory and high performance. We drink loads of alcohol. And you've got to be paying attention to your sleep, you know, and even just kind of, you know, swapping away from your high carb processed breakfast and moving on to the bulletproof coffee. Have that to start your day. Brain octane before the exam. The number of medical students who reached out and said thanks for that. Yeah, because people go hypoglycemic because of the stress. Yeah. The stress compounds the high carb diet, so they go hypoglycemic. So they're all over the place in a state of adrenaline. They can't actually access their memory around and they're just freaking out. So you've got to have a core stress reduction practice, heart rate variability, meditation, yoga, whatever works, whatever you kind of lean to, you've got to have that as your foundations. Nootropics, mm-hmm. good diet, alcohol out. Um, and also, so here's a, here's a hack for, for getting through exams. I, I didn't attend a lot of my lectures. And for a very good reason, there was a girl who sat in the front row who was amazing at taking notes. <laughs> and I did a deal with her. I said, That's so smart. At the end of the year, I will purchase those notes. Yeah. And I'll reward you financially for it. 
And what I was really good at was actually, because her notes were just brilliant, just organizing those notes, highlighting it, putting it into a format I could remember it. And that's how I, that's how I did it. Come up with a system that works for you. And also find ways of getting really excited about what you're learning. Because people who get excited yeah. about what they're learning, and you say, if you think, oh, it's just biochemistry, it's gonna be really hard for you to remember that. You gotta relate it. It's like, you know, this is really important biochemistry that gives me information to help myself to help my future patients. You reframe it, mm -hmm. you get really engaged with it, and it just ups your ability to actually uh, store, store information. The thing about understanding your, your cognitive style is, is really important. I talk about how smart drugs got me through business school. The other thing is, I, I didn't quite realize this at the time, but I, I'm not a great auditory learner. Mm. I, I, like to, to, I like to talk about stuff. Mm. I, I'm a good auditory sharer, but I absorb information visually. Yeah. And what that means is that sitting in a lecture is not very productive use of time for me either. So, and under artificial lights. Oh yeah, which, which give me a yeah. whole brain like, in fact, 48% oh, yeah. of people are made weak by that according yeah. to Helen Erlen. So all right, yeah. so that was an issue. Mm. So what I did is I, I had my, my secret Ryan Powers, my, my buddy Ryan, who may or may not be listening to this, uh, who's now a, a successful CFO type uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, he was the best note taker I've ever seen. He was top of his class at, at Berkeley before he came to Wharton. And uh, he was just kind enough to share his notes with me. I'm like, oh, I can absorb these. This is like straight go. up uploading, yeah. like in the matrix. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. I know karate kind of thing. Like, okay, yeah. for me, that was far more valuable than a lecture. And it doesn't mean that, that I'm a bad person or whatever else. It just means yeah. that's how I learn. Yeah. So if that's yeah. your deal, just you, sh do you should do it. And, and here's another hack I've never talked about. And uh, my, this is from earlier in my academic career, but I once decided I was going to take a double course load in one semester. So two semesters in one, I just wanted to graduate. Mm. And I got the highest GPA of my academic career during that time because mm. I, I did this 80-20 rule. I, I, look, in that class, I think I'll just you know, maybe fail it or, or maybe get a C and I got an A anyway. Mm. Uh, but that was the first semester I had a laptop. And I was the only one in class who had it. And I used to play this game called Free Cell. Just, it's kind of a mindless game. Mm. But what I found was if I played that game, it would engage my brain and I'd listen and I would just alt tab, switch over, take notes. So at the end of the class, I had beautiful notes. And the entire time, everyone thought I was playing video games. Mm. And it pissed them all off. And I, I was kind of a jerk, because I'd be like, well, here's the deal. Looking at my screen while I'm taking notes is very rude. So I'm offended that you were looking at my computer. <laughs> right? And <laughs> so then we were at a standoff. <laughs> and I'm like, by the way, I'm top of the class. So mm. like, if you have a problem with me playing video games, I don't care. Mm. Uh, mm. So. Mm. It's changed now and people are distracted and doing social mm. media and all sorts of, ba of bad stuff that probably takes mm. you out of it. But if you need a hack like that, mm. uh, I probably had undiagnosed ADD at the time. I was still drinking diet soda. This was going way back. But I found a way to keep my brain engaged. So like, if something works for you, like, I don't mm. care what it is. Uh, you do it. And, and yeah. for me, I, I literally was coming up with like new economic theories and like ways of doing math differently in economics, which mm. is even my subject, because mm. my brain was never allowed to stop because I was like looking for where the ace could stack up with some <laughs> <laughs> and the brains are awesome. But so, so whatever it takes for you. Just yeah, just, just, just find your way, yeah. think out of the box, be open to anything really and just find your way. And, and you, your thing with kind of revising for, for medical school is just keep it linked into the fact is that this exam serves my ability to eventually become a medical doctor to help others. Keep that larger context there and it kind of really yeah. helps. Yeah, doing it for a reason, not just to have a career. Like yeah. I, I'm gonna do this for money. If you're, if you're going to school for money, you should quit right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would say if you're going to school because you think it's gonna help you do something amazing. It'll yeah. Okay, do you want to uh, sure. scroll it? Uh, oh, here, I got yeah. it. Uh, Joseph, age 52. I've been into personal development for over 30 years and I've developed a lot of self-awareness and I'm now living close to my ideal life. I have, a, um, I have a great relationship with my wife, wonderful children, I enjoy the work I do. Can you share a bit about your own personal development journey and what you've learned about yourself and about life? Um, I think that, well, I think we, we could both talk about that. You mm. are you're a very experienced personal development guy and I yeah. think that um, certainly, the Joseph is meaning to ask me that as well. So, mm. uh, walk through your stuff because sure. a big part of the Bulletproof Coach training program, mm. people don't know this. Like, you're a medical doctor, mm. but it's personal development. It is. Because 
I teach people how to control their biology, but once you get your mitochondria firing so that you actually have enough energy in the body, once you get your hormone systems online, once you're able to make BDNF, brain-derived nootropic factors, so you actually grow new neurons, what are you going to do with all that? Well, that's when the personal development work can happen. Yeah. It, if you feel like you did when you had SIBO, or you have mold mm -hmm. in your house, mm -hmm. or you're just fat and your energy regulation mm -hmm. systems are off, it's too much work to do personal development. Like yeah. you'll go to the meditation retreat and you'll fall asleep and, and you'll come back and just think you're a bad person. Mm. And and so I think hitting the biology first and then hitting the brain chemistry mm. and then hitting the personal development programming is important. But that's where our coaching program is a physician with personal development experience because you've got to have the basis of biology and then do personal development. And and Joseph, I don't know uh, how much biology you're doing in personal development. It's possible to meditate on a, on a vegan diet. You just meditate better when you add ghee to your vegan diet. Like, that's mm. just how it is. Mm. So Yeah. It is a revelation when you come to understand that the number one priority is taking care of your biology. Because it is so easy to get distracted reading a little, whole bunch of self-help books that you never do anything with. At the time, you kind of feel mm -hmm. disinterested. But there's a couple of things you need to do personal development. You need energy. You need to be able to focus. And you need to be able to really get really clear about what matters most. And if your biology is scrambled, yeah. you can't do that. That is, that for me, the, the essential foundation. Then once you've done that, then you've got to learn basic core essential skills. Working with emotions. So emotional intelligence. You've got to learn social intelligence, how to relate to others, how to really listen and hear what another person is saying, as opposed to being up in my head um, or caught up in my stories, just waiting for an opportunity to share with this other person what I think, and not really engaging with them. And then if you're into spiritual development, it's like, what's that in service of? And it's about developing a personal relationship with some source of insight or wisdom that sustains you and helps you become a better person. And so we all find a way through this, but what I see a lot of is self-help addiction <laughs> as a bypass to life. Because I don't yeah. know about how you feel about this, but 90% of, of who I have become and what I have learned has come about through life experience, not from reading countless self-help books. And I always recall a time when I was sitting next to my wife, reading a book about relationships, how to be emotionally intimate. And my wife was there wanting to be emotionally intimate, but I wasn't because I was reading my book. <laughs> So I was reading about, and, and, and in that moment, I had this light bulb goes like, wow, how many times have I been bypassing the very thing I want by turning to a book and looking for the answers there? And so I think our relationship to the present moment and to life is crucial to this. And it's a willingness to face everything and avoid nothing. And to do that, you have to be able to learn how to tolerate discomfort. And when yeah. you do that, you start to clean up every area of your life, your relationships, your personal health, your work life, your finances, and face everything, do nothing, pay attention to the present moment, managing energy, managing perception, because that's, it's like so many people project all of their personal stuff into the people around them, and they start blaming other people, whereas actually it's all about them. You have to have a basic understanding of how perception shows up and impacts on your relationships. This is everything we teach in the Bulletproof Coach Training Program. Why do we do this? Because when someone shows up as a Bulletproof Coach and the client engages them, I want them to know that this Bulletproof Coach has done the inner work to mature yeah. themselves. They're living in their integrity. They're passionate about it because they've experienced the benefits themselves. And so not only are they able to facilitate deep insight and change and uh, realizing goals for the client, but they can also impart all this amazing wisdom and insight about how to improve their biology and their energy. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't normally get that with a coach. Yeah. That's why it's unique. It, it's usually one or the other, and, and this, it's, the Bulletproof Coaching Program is not a, um, a nutrition coaching program. Like no. I, I send people to uh, Cynthia Pasquale's uh, course, the Institute for Transformational Nutrition. It, yeah. is, is one of the really good ones where they go really deep on, on yeah. food. We go deep enough to say these are the kryptonite foods, these are the high energy foods, like this is the bulletproof roadmap. Yeah. That provides the fuel to do what's really in coaching. And, mm -hmm. and just addiction to, to personal development training is kind of a, a funny concept. I see the same thing in entrepreneurs, and I, I mentor uh, some entrepreneurs, and I'm an advisor to startups and have been for many years. Mm -hmm. 
there's a, a type of, of, of thing, it's actually becoming an epidemic right now. I'd call them wantrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Like you, you read a book that tells you, you know, you can go live on an island and, you know, uh, make enough money to, to you know, yeah. surf all day, every day or something. Mm-hmm. And that's cool, right? Mm-hmm. If, if that's what you want to do. But there's a lot of people who spend more money and time on courses to learn how to like hack their tools or something than to just go out and start a company. And I, I actually think starting a company is, is harder. It's mm-hmm. actually an act of creation. It's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it requires a certain level of personal development to do that successfully. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, you end up making really bad decisions. Mm-hmm. So there's a parallel in personal development uh, to being an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think that there's a, I, I, want, I want to be enlightened versus I want to do some work. I have no idea if I'll do it. But like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to actually start meditating instead of reading books about meditation. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing goes for starting companies. Like I'm mm. either going to start a company or I'm going to read books and take online yeah. courses. And yeah. like, there's just a, a very different mindset. Mm-hmm. And it, it actually is, it's all the same thing that always comes uh, from procrastination. And yeah. it's fear. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's fear based. And in Bulletproof Coaching, we have a whole section on success. First yeah. of all, how to really drill down to what success is. And you know what it comes back down to? It requires a whole bunch of things. You need energy, you need focus, you need clarity, you need passion. You need perseverance, you need humility, you need resilience, and you need grit. And above all else, given all those, you need to take action. And the amount of times I come across people who talk a good game, I just say spend all the time reading the books, doing the courses, and they just need to take action. Because the greatest learning comes from just showing up in life, engaging with what's in front of you, and doing it to the best of your ability. And wherever possible, being surrounded by mentors and people who can support you and and, and encourage you. Uh, I I love that perspective. And and Joseph, you're asking, you know, share some of my own personal development journey and what I learned about myself and about life. Uh, I didn't believe too much in personal development. Uh, I I kind of did subscribe to the computer science Asperger's syndrome uh, model of reality. Uh, which is you know that we're kind of meat robots. So I did this until my my first marriage like completely like failed. And so you, you generally to go on a path of personal development, most people, uh, unless they're unusual, uh, have to like have some source of misery. In my case, like I'm fat. Like my biologists work. I have brain fog all the time. I have emotional dysregulation. Uh, I have bad smelling farts, as we disclosed earlier. Um, and just generally, like my life wasn't, it wasn't good on some levels, but dude, I'm like economically successful. I, I already have had this career that's like industry changing, disrupting giant things. The first ever e-commerce product sold was like a t-shirt out of my dorm room. Mm. Like I'm kicking ass uh, from one perspective and I'm completely failing on another. And, and I just was like, wow, I, I have to face failure. And I got to the point where I'm working at this startup. I'm uh, let's see, I'm just finished up my MBA at, uh, uh, in business school. And uh, I remember I sat down with, with my boss at the time and I'm like, I need to take off 10 days. And he goes, what? And I go, like, it's like a family thing. He goes, but like, no warning? Like, like what's going on? And I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm getting divorced. And, and he just mm-hmm. sat down. He was like, are you kidding me? Like, like you, I had no idea. Like, you never said anything. None of my friends had any idea that I was going through any of that stuff because I'm just like, you know, I'll just, I'll push through. Right, and so for me, it was like to realize, all right, I failed, but uh, the one thing that if you're a rational person, or at least you believe you're a rational person, that you'll just, all right, well, then you do a root cause analysis. It also mm-hmm. helps that, well, I actually used to design software that did root cause analysis of complex systems. So, all right, so I'm pretty well equipped for event correlation and root cause analysis. So a friend of mine said, do this personal development course. Uh, and I'm like, I'm really skeptical of this stuff. And she said, well, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but just trust me, uh, you'll you'll get something out of it. So not knowing what else to do, I went off and spent 10 days at a transpersonal psychology workshop called the Star Foundation. And I did holotropic breathing and birth regression and, and kind of came out of there going, holy crap, I had no idea that there's all these weird emotions that are like residing in the body and that I'm actually afraid almost all the time because I was born with a cord wrapped around my neck. So I came into the world biologically programmed to believe mm. that the world was a, a frightening and scary place with things trying to choke you to death. I didn't believe those things rationally. I didn't even know that those things were running in my biology. But those are the background rules that are that are written in our uh, in our bodies, and it's that programming that's invisible to us that is the cause of most mm. suffering and most procrastination and most of the really bad decisions you've made. 
And if you read the Bulletproof Diet book, and by the way, if you're listening to this and you haven't read the Bulletproof Diet book, it's not about the diet. It's actually about having more willpower. It's just food is one of the big inputs for willpower. And I talk about the Labrador brain in there, and that is the best simplification I, I can get of all these things. But we are, we are programmed to live as, as meat operating systems. It's those programs that betray us and make us do bad things. And most personal development is really all about becoming aware of the programs you have, learning how to first see them and then how to re reset them, how to reprogram them. What I do now with like CEO coaching clients, and I do very little CEO coaching. I still occasionally do it if it's someone I really, really uh, want to make time to spend with. But right now I, I like family time and I'm bulletproof is growing and I'm, I'm, I'm creating masses of content and things like that. But I still occasionally coach people. And I, I always do something that I've spent 10 weeks of my life doing, and that's something called 40 Years of Zen. Uh, 40 Years of Zen is a neurofeedback training program, uh, one that I've, uh, I've really invested even more in lately, uh, where we've added a whole bunch of new technology that, that wasn't available in earlier generations of this. And this is, in fact, <laughs> I haven't really disclosed this, I'm doing neurofeedback training. Like I have a neuroscientist dedicated to Bulletproof staff right now because it's so important that we get these nasty dysfunctional rules out of our nervous systems mm. to be good human beings. That also lets us like do more good work at work and at home. Like you're, you'll be a better parent, a better son, a better daughter, a better spouse, a better partner when you, when you disrupt this programming. So what I did was for 10 weeks of my life, you glue electrodes to your head and run what's essentially a lie detector against yourself. And you, you say something that looks like this. I forgive so-and-so for whatever, because pretty much every program that you have running in your body is your body being pissed off about something that happened, even if it happened when you were two years old. I didn't get the cookie I wanted, so I felt like no one loved me. If you got a program like that, you might be eating cookies all day long because cookies equal love to you, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you know what's happening. It's invisible. But when you have a lie detector hooked up to your head, it's not invisible anymore. Because every time you say, I don't have an issue with cookies, you essentially get a signal that you don't hear the sounds, like your brain shut down. So my powers of self-deception are incredibly powerful, and so are yours. Yeah. Uh, so, and you've done 40 years of Zen, <laughs> and have, you've, yeah. you've, you've brought other people in through the program as well. You know exactly what I'm talking about Absolutely. here. So I shortcut this personal development journey. It's called 40 years of Zen because it's designed to put you in the same mathematically uh, uh, depicted brain state as someone who spent 40 years doing daily Zen practice, an advanced Zen master. I'm not a Zen master. I haven't done all the Zen training. I've been to Tibet. I've trained with Zen masters. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been to Mount Kailash, and I've, I've done all sorts of breathing exercises, personal growth. I could put my ankle behind my head, like yoga, stuff like that. Uh, but nothing compares to having a real-time signal that says, you think you're done with that? You're not done mm. with that. So you have to just go deep and go deep. I've never been through the training when I do it to myself without crying or throwing up at least once mm -hmm. in, in a week's worth of training. It's a five-day course now. Uh, I have, uh, I've never had a client go through without mm -hmm. uh, crying or throwing up or having really intense emotional experiences. This is the scary stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's scary because your nervous system is designed to keep your meat alive. And if you are in control of your nervous system, your nervous system thinks you might do something stupid. So it tries to keep you from running your own biology. Uh, that's, that's unacceptable, okay. at least for me and my body and the world that I live in. So I will give my body maximum power, maximum energy, I'll give my brain maximum energy, and I'll use that energy to gain control of my nervous system. Like that is why I'm a biohacker. Like that's the essence of personal development right mm -hmm. there as well. But why would you go on, in your case, Joseph, a, a 30 year struggle? You do it because you can see that there's value in it. Mm -hmm. But why would you spend 30 years without signposts without, in my case, I have rubber bumpers and buzzers when I do it wrong. And that lets me get a lot more progress. I, I would not be running Bulletproof. I would not be sitting here right now communicating the way I am right now without stress, without having done this extensive neurological hacking. And none of that stuff works without enough mitochondrial function. Number one, biology. Number two, Address the software. Uh, yeah. That's the essence of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I get it. And and just feedback accelerates personal development yeah. because we are creatures of profound self-deception. Mm -hmm. Profound. I mean, <laughs> and the more you start to see it, it, it's it's astonishing how profound yeah. it is. And that feedback process just gives you really helpful information because unfinished emotional business is a major impediment to personal development. And so I've I've done the same training yeah. and. 
That's then, why we can work together on the coaching yeah. program the way we do, because yeah. like we can talk in the same language. Yeah. It also means that you can hold your ground, well, it's just called energetically, I don't know how to describe it, but we do have a magnetic field around ourselves, and you can sense that stuff when, when you're trained. Uh, when, when there's someone who, who would be pushing your buttons, but you've actually taken the labels off your buttons, and mm. you, took, you cut the wires behind the buttons, so you push a button, and there's nothing there. Just present. And yeah, right. So someone can completely unload their baggage on you, and you don't lose sleep over it. You don't play it over in your head. The voice in your head doesn't say anything about it, right? That's when you know you you've got it. And I I turned off the voice in my head. There isn't some mean, nasty person in there second guessing me and making me socially anxious the way it used mm. to. And you know they they think I'm fat or they don't like me or mm. I bet I sound stupid or I bet they think they're better than me or they have more money <laughs> than me or they have bigger equipment than me that one's just not possible uh, there's no upgrade about no, I'm kidding but like all those dumb things that that run yeah, in our heads yeah, it's yeah. all complete programming just yeah. baggage and it's all hackable that's what I did that's my path yeah. and it's not a normal personal development path yeah and and, and you know people need to realize that high performing people um, you know such as you're describing there that are the way they are because of the work they've done. Oh yeah. Very rarely do you get born in this kind of healthy, relaxed, kind of spacious kind of state of high performance. You've got to work at it. And you know, it's patience, it's perseverance, it's learning from others, and it's a willingness, and it requires a lot of courage. It requires oh, yeah. a lot of courage to face yourself. Oh, it's one of the most terrifying things you'll do. In yeah. fact, I guarantee you, anyone who's doing real personal development work will hit the point where you feel like generally or genuinely you are going to die, and that yeah. is your body going. No, seriously, I'm not. I'm not kidding. Like at one time, I was, mm. I was, in uh, in the 40 years of Zen, electrodes on, and I could. There was something that that wasn't working for me, and I couldn't figure out what it was, which is really frustrating when you're like trying to reprogram a rule and the rule keeps moving around. You're like, what the hell? Mm. So I, I'm I'm sitting in there and. I started like like just visualize trying to figure out where I was, and pretty soon my stupid nervous system is sending me images of of myself pouring gas on myself and lighting myself on fire. Okay, mm. I'm not gonna light myself on fire. That's that mm. that was literally mm. my nervous system going. No, seriously, dude, do not look there. Like, mm. don't look there. Think about like the most horrible, painful, burning death uh, possible. Think about that instead of looking here. And as soon as that happened, I'm like, oh, cool, I found it. Right. Yeah. And. That's where you go, <laughs> but it, that's that's yeah. it takes courage, right? Yeah, because because the, the ego is constantly trying to um, distract you mm -hmm. from the very thing that will make the most significant difference yeah. to you. So the more it hurts and the more it sucks, the the better it is for personal yeah, development. That's where the gold is, and, and that's why it takes courage and perseverance, and and frankly, yeah. having an accountability partner, having a good relationship. So yeah, yeah. like when when you feel like wussing out, your your partner or your friend or your coach. One of the reasons we have a coaching program mm. is there to stand up. You're like, uh, you know, you better get back in there and, and do your work, right? Yeah. Right. You're not allowed to wuss out now. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you know what? The results are kinder, healthier human beings who are bringing their gifts to themselves in service of the greater good and and just enriching the world, enriching life. Yeah. And and that's such a blessing. So you're not just doing it for yourself. You know, it, they're just so many benefits to it. So it was amazing, really great to read that you'd done so much work and that you felt you were living a close to an ideal life because, and if you're, if you're a father or a mother, what, what you bring to your kids and as a role model and the energy you bring the family has such profound impact. And you know, we have such influence over our children by the way we are. Yeah. And so there's so many gifts to be doing this. It's not just about ourselves, it's about others, but such a, such a great question and, and just totally. great to be able to share about experience. Kind of a long answer there, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was an awesome last question, Joseph. Uh, thanks for asking that and giving us both the opportunity to sort of, of go off on personal development mm -hmm. tangents and, mm -hmm. and talk about some of this. Uh, and I hope uh, when you're listening to this, that this is, is valuable for you. You don't have to attach electrodes to your head or even to your ear to do heart rate variability training. You can start meditating. You can start doing breathing exercises. You, you can take up yoga, pranayama. Uh, I did art of living for a long time with a, a bunch of entrepreneurs. This is a, a set of breathing exercises that came out of India. I actually met one of the Nobel laureates, uh, one of the guys behind the Black Shoals options pricing model at one of these things. Uh, it's it kind of mm -hmm. funny. There's some very powerful people who have a daily breathing practice. So do something. Whatever it is, there's lots of free things you can do. And I've read about different breathing exercises on, on the Bulletproof blog and things like that. So just do something. And if you want to go big, uh, well, that, that, I was just talking about how to do that. Uh, the rest of these questions here, you learned something about uh, 
it, gastrointestinal health and what it does to cause brain fog, even if you don't have IBS or, or irritable bowel or ulcerative colitis or celiac or any of those other diseases, uh, properly functioning gut means you have more energy. We didn't talk about this, but your IQ can vary very substantially on a daily basis based on the amount of energy you have and the amount of toxins circulating in your blood, uh, based on how much sleep you got, based on how stressed you are. So, well, this is one of the, the variables for being a high-performance person is being a high-performance digestion machine. Mm. And uh, we talked about some ways to hack school, and specifically med school, but other things. So I hope this is all helpful for you. I'm grateful that you take time to send in questions. If you, uh, you can send voicemails to us through SpeakPipe. There's links on the blog for that. You can ask questions on Facebook. You can do it in comments on the blog. And we do our best to, to uh, collect all of that stuff. And at the bottom of the screen here, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll actually put a link for where you can go to ask questions for, uh, for the show. Have an awesome day. And Mark, I'll see you on the next episode. Sounds great. Thank you. Did you know that Bulletproof is on Instagram? You can find us at Bulletproof Coffee or my personal feed is dave.asprey. Hope to see you there.